Well, we're coming towards the end of our journey through this letter of 1 Timothy. And in this section and the next, Paul pulls together many of the strings that we've seen throughout the letter. And as we've seen since the end of chapter 3, uh, this idea of godliness has been a key theme. But Paul adds in the idea of contentment. So the sermon I preached from this section, I called the importance of contentment. As always, I encourage you to go and read through the section yourself and look for repetition, look for important ideas that seem to jump out of this text. Look for key ideas that we've seen throughout the book so far that Paul uh, re reintroduces or comes back to in this section. Spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand this part of his word. If you have missed other videos from 1 Timothy, then I encourage you to go back and watch those just to familiarize yourself with the key themes that we've seen in the book so far. And as always, I'm going to highlight just some of what I've seen in this text. Now, Paul starts here with um, this call to these are the things you are to teach and insist on. And this section has two imperatives. So a, a verb that's a command. He says teach. It's an imperative and insist on. It's another imperative. The the ESV translates this uh, quite nicely closer to the original text where it is teach and urge these things. So imperative, teach, an imperative, urge, these things. So to start with two big imperatives like that, verbs that are commands, Paul is really putting a lot of emphasis on this. And these things, these are the things you are to teach and insist on. Um, I take it that this is referring to all of the instruction that Paul is giving to Timothy in this letter because he's going to come back to the false teachers who he referred to back in chapter 1 already. He spoke more about them in chapter 4 and he's coming back. These are the things you are to teach and insist on and they are the truths that center on salvation through Jesus. Salvation through Jesus has been uh, right at the center of this whole letter. Uh, we saw it in chapter 1, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We saw it in chapter 2, where Paul said, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to understand the truth. Paul, the heartbeat of this letter is for this church in Ephesus to keep evangelism, to keep holding out this truth about salvation through Jesus, to keep that at the center of all, of all of what they do. And so Paul says, teach and urge these things. And then he says, if anyone teaches otherwise. So he's contrasting. If somebody comes in and teaches things that are different to these things, these gospel truths, these truths about uh, godliness, if they teach anything other than that, then watch out. And there's a real heaviness about this passage because Paul really gets to the heart of what was the problem with these false teachers. And I think the very important verse that we see in this section, right at the heart of the section, is this verse. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, as I said, Paul has spoken a lot about godliness so far, but he's adding in this idea of contentment in, in this section. And... What it appears here is that these false teachers weren't content in Jesus. Or the erring elders. Because they didn't see that Jesus was enough, it ended up causing massive issues in their own hearts and in the teaching that they were teaching to others. And the terrible effects of this was that, as we see here, it was plunging people into ruin and destruction. So there really is a massive heaviness over this whole section. And what we see is that they weren't teaching the truth. They were teaching otherwise. They weren't teaching people uh, what it truly looks like uh, to be godly. So as I said, we see this uh, godliness uh, is a key theme that is picked up again. 
And just for the important context around um, godliness, go and reread chapter uh, 3, verse 14 to 16, where we see that the truth from which true godliness springs is this good news of salvation through Jesus. It's the gospel. The gospel fuels our godly living, where here they were seeking to live godly lives, but with the wrong motive. Uh, in order to gain finances. So they were trying to look the part, but with an evil heart. And that is a real problem that we see in this section. So they weren't teaching uh, the sound instruction. Uh, They weren't teaching that which uh, promotes or accords to godliness. Uh, The result of their teaching wasn't causing people to love Jesus more and live with Jesus as their king more. Rather, they were conceited, we see. They were interested in controversies and ultimately they were corrupt. So conceited, controversial and corrupt. To be conceited is to be puffed up with pride. So instead of putting the spotlight on Jesus, they were putting the spotlight on themselves. And this showed that they actually understood nothing. They hadn't understood these things, the truths about Jesus. Uh, We saw back in chapter 1 already that they wanted to be teachers of the law, but they didn't understand what they were talking about. So they were people who seemed to have it all together. They seemed to have a whole lot of understanding, but very clearly by the way they lived, their understanding was lacking and they understood nothing. And so Paul is putting the spotlight on these people who teach other things. Uh, They have an unhealthy interest in controversies. Uh, They cause friction between corrupt people. They want to get rich. And because they're eager for money, he says they've wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So not only are they uh, conceited, putting the spotlight on themselves, puffed up with pride, Uh, He says they also have an unhealthy interest in controversies. Uh, This is, the unhealthy here is um, uh, the word nausea in Greek, nauseous, a sick or a morbid fascination with controversies and quarrels about words. So this idea of quarrels about words, uh, Paul speaks of again in uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 14. So you can go and cross-reference there. And there he also says that it leads to uh, ruin. And the the word there in 2 Timothy 2 verse 14 is the Greek word katastrophe. It has catastrophic results. So he's saying don't be interested in controversies and quarrels about words. It doesn't achieve godliness, true godliness with contentment. Rather, it results in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction. So that is the opposite of the true godliness that we are looking for. And why? Well, he says here, because they have been robbed of the truth. So instead of um, teaching the sound instruction, the true message, um, they've, they've been robbed of the truth. They've wandered from the faith. So it's as if somebody's come and pickpocketed them. And because they don't have the truth anymore, they are, it is seen in their ungodliness, in their conceit, in their controversies, in their corruption. Another way of translating this, they have corrupt minds and robbed of the truth. They are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. And it's seen in that they think that Godliness is a means of financial gain. And Paul then puts the spotlight on the danger of seeking, of desiring to get rich. This word, they want to or they desire to get rich. And he shows that this is ultimately deadly. This verse is a stark condemnation on the health, wealth and prosperity gospel. That's never what the, the gospel was meant to produce in us. It wasn't meant to make us rich uh, financially in this world. It's, the gospel is meant to cause us to love Jesus, to be content in Jesus, in who he is and what we have because of him. 
But here we see these false te teachers desired to get rich. And Paul says here, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The evil he's already spoken of, evil like conceit, being puffed up with pride, being controversial and corrupt, but many other evils. And those eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So the result of their desire to get rich says it's, they fall into temptation, a trap, many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. They've wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So although the world of their day and the world of our day it tries to make us think that money is the answer, Paul is making it very clear that if you desire to get rich, if you love money, then it's the root of all kinds of evil. Now, in next, the next passage, we'll see Paul addresses those who are rich, and he tells them that actually the problem isn't ultimately money, it's the love of money. So if you are rich in this present age, he tells them to live generously. And so money itself isn't the problem. And he's going to address those who are rich in the next section. But here he's saying, if you are seeking riches in this world, then it's going to end up plunging you and others into ruin and destruction. It's going to lead to many griefs. So there really is a heaviness over this whole section. But then right in the middle here, verses 6, 7, and 8 give the answer. So godliness with contentment is great gain. And this is, we, are, we should be content in Jesus, in who he is, in the salvation that we have through him. In Paul's earlier letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 1, he said, we've been blessed in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing. And if we were to go through Paul's letters, go through the gospel and see what we get because of salvation through Jesus, it should fuel our contentment in him. And that contentment in Jesus then should drive us to live godly lives. Because if we are truly content in Jesus, it will fuel us to be content in every other aspect of our lives. And Paul says, ultimately, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of the world. In, in the light of eternity, with an eternal perspective, we need to realize that trying to gain riches in this world, we're going to leave it all behind. So if you gain riches in this world, rather use it in a way that is for God's glory, which we'll see in the next passage. But if we have food and clothing, if we have the basics, we'll be content with that. Because if we are truly content in Jesus, then we will pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, give us today our daily bread and help us to be content with that. Because the dangers of not being content with that with the desire to get rich, you end up in a trap, foolish and deadly, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction because it actually shows that you've wandered from the faith. And so Paul wants his hearers, he wanted Timothy, he wanted the church in Ephesus, he wants us to hear the warning of this passage, saying, if you aren't content in Jesus, in the salvation that he won for you, it's going to end up in with ter terrible, terrible consequences. It'll be seen in ungodly living, uh, trying to uh, live a godly life, but with an evil heart, with the wrong motives. But actually, if you are truly content in Jesus, it will cause you to live a godly life that is shaped by the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done, a life that will truly hold that truth up for the world around you to see. And the real challenge in this section is that if, you, if we notice a lack of contentment in Jesus, then we need to pray and ask God to grow in us a real contentment in him, to realize that he came to save sinners like us, and he wants us to place our trust in him. He wants us to find our true satisfaction in him. And then he, he's saying, because godliness with contentment in Jesus is great gain, not only in this life, but even when we leave this life. It is ga great gain, both in this life and in the world to come. Now, this is a real challenge for us. 
in our world that is not content, that's always telling us that we need a little bit more. And so we need to pray and encourage each other to see the importance of contentment in Jesus. Let's help each other to really rejoice in, delight in Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. So as you dig in further, I pray that your own heart would meditate on and see how much we have in Jesus. And that as you teach this to others, that you would help them to also see how amazing Jesus is. Well, God bless as you dig in further.